Welcome to True View. I'm Jamie Shaver. And I'm Julie Van Gorp. And coming up, we are going to take an in-depth look as to why Paul talked to the people of Corinth and used the Olympic athlete to help us strive for the Olympic crown in our spiritual walk. And to do this, we interviewed previous Olympian athlete Molly Tuman, as well as former NFL football players Pete Gonzalez and Stephen Avery. And we've also got a coach in there, Jamie, as well. When you see all the incredible analogies between the spiritual training and the physical training, you're not going to want to miss this episode. So stay tuned so you too can be a champion of faith. I'm Jamie Shaver. Welcome to True View. I'm Jamie Shaver, and I've got with me my co host and our Bible scholar, Julie Van Gorp. And we're breaking this down because Paul says to the church in Corinth, Look, we need to run our spiritual race as if we're Olympians. That's powerful and he actually calls them to this in verse 9 24. do you not know that in a race all runners win but only one receives the prize so run as if to obtain it every athlete exercises self-control in all things and they do this to win a wreath that is perishable yet we are doing it for the imperishable julie break this verse down for us what i love about the bible jamie is it speaks to the people of that day, but it's also very relevant today. But the people of Corinth were very familiar with this passage and what it meant because they had the games. It would be like living right by where the Olympic games. And so they knew there was a huge stadium where the runners would come and they would train vigorously. You had to train for at least 10 months. You had to follow a very, very strict diet. You had to endure heat and cold elements and in every way subject your body in such a way that you were gonna go out there and win the game. And the difference is that only one, they would have all these athletes ready to compete in their various games and yet only one could win the prize. And yet they were willing to do that for a crown that they received at the end. The winner got a crown and it was like leaves that were put in a wreath <laughs> that we all know that only lasts for a few days and then it's gone. And he's saying, if they were willing to work that hard for something that would fade in a matter of days, how much more should we as Christians prepare ourselves, train, be willing to exercise self-control in order to obtain Jesus, which is the prize, the reward we have as Christians. And it's an everlasting reward. So we thought, what better way to really make this grand analogy and take it a step further than to go and actually speak with someone who is trained for the Olympics. Molly Tuman, who is the co-owner of Raw Training here in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, had spent over two years at the Olympic Training Center preparing for the U.S. Olympics in volleyball. Let's watch this interview now. It's a lifestyle, it really is. Um, it's something that, you know, you, you train hard when you're here at the gym, but you've gotta be as dedicated outside of the gym. When you leave here, you've gotta to continue to eat right, you know, make sure you're hydrated, get enough sleep. Um, you know, all of those factors go into the training. So you can't just come in here and train hard and then and leave and, and kind of, you know, do whatever. You've got to, you know, to, to make the, get the results that you want in the training, it's, it's kind of a lifestyle change. You know, working hard for a goal, no matter what that, that goal is, being dedicated, having a focus, and staying on track, and, you know, living your life towards that goal, um, whatever it may be, that's a, a great, you know, thing I learned with the training center. I mean, we were solely focused on getting to be the best volleyball players that we could be and focusing on making that team and, and going to the Olympics with that goal of bringing home the gold. So that's, you know, you have that goal and that's, that was very, we were very focused on that. And I think that that has transferred into my life that, you know, whatever it may be. Um, for me, you know, it was, built, you know, starting a gym and having that focus and that goal of starting this, 
starting raw and um, building it to be the best gym that that we could make it and um, being that that gym that we you know we, we created a place where um, it was the kind of gym that we that we would want to train at so that's kind of how we, we it was different from a regular global gym so that's kind of how we, we came upon I love to see you know people making gains I love to see people getting the results that they want when they put the work in and they put the effort in it shows and they get results and I love that I love to see people you know getting stronger and you know hitting their goals whether their goals are to gain weight or to lose weight you know or to um, you know get stronger or to be more functionally you know more mobi mobile with more movement so that's um, you know it's awesome to see that to see the changes and just helping people in their life you know that's um, uh, that's why we do this exactly why we do this Welcome back, that was a great interview with Molly. Julie, help us make some analogies to what she said as an Olympic athlete, to what Paul is telling us to be spiritual Olympians of the faith. There are so many, Jamie. One of them is that when she was talking about being that in the Olympic village and that she couldn't be around her family, her entire life had to change. What she ate, what she drank, with who she was You're not saying I can't living. be with my family if I want to be a Christian, right? <laughs> well, and, unless God calls you in that, Jamie. But there is the place where we have to say we are either all in. She was completely dedicated. She gave two years of her life to pursue that goal. And we as believers are also called to be all in. God isn't looking for a half-hearted devotion. He wants us to be wholeheartedly devoted to Him. And when we are, we're gonna change our life. It says in the Word of God that we become a new creation in Christ. So there are gonna be some very significant changes. I know even for you, Jamie, people who knew you before you came to Christ would look and say, wow, she's a different person now. That's what God's looking and for. You know, I didn't know that you could train for life, but when you, when we become Christians, God does say, hey, let me help you train you so that you can have more from life and that abundant life that is only found in Christ. And we've got to keep our eyes on the goal. And the goal really as a believer is to please Jesus. We're no longer living for our pleasure. We're not eat, drink, and be merry for, you know, tomorrow we die <laughs> kind of a mentality. We are, we're going to eat the bread of life which is Jesus, the Word of God, we want to consume that because we know that's our daily sustenance. And He is, Jesus is also called the living water, which really means the purity. We no longer want to live as we used to do. We don't want to be pursuing the pleasures of this world because those are fleeting, they're temporary. We want to live in such a way that we're pleasing God. And we know what pleases God is to clothe ourselves in humility. It's to bridle our tongue, you know, to exercise that self-control, to take our thoughts captive and no longer be thinking as the way we used to. It's like, just as when Molly was training, she had to have a whole new mindset of, okay, when I'm coming in, I'm all in. She couldn't be distracted by anything else. It was keeping her mind on the goal at all times and why? because there was such an incredible reward as an Olympic athlete. She was pursuing after that gold medal, but how much more for us to pursue because what our reward is, is spending eternity in paradise with Jesus and with other believers forever. Talk to me about the discipline. When she talks about the discipline, she was tracking everything, the food, the sleep, the water. And then I know she even mentions, hey, we were training for, for, for the game, the, the game of volleyball. But then after that training, we had to go on and train more, right. uh, you know, just to train our muscles. And it's so important for us as believers to take that assessment. I think one of the most important ways we track it, Jamie, um, is every night to really, before you go to bed at night, say, Lord, you know, is there anything in me that I did today that was displeasing to you? That daily assessment. Do I need to forgive? Do I, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Is there anybody to whom I need to go and make amends yeah. in order to reflect? But journaling can be a wonderful I was just way. I say that. That's huge yes. because when you even journal as an athlete as to how much you've lifted and what weights you're at, you can then look back and it allows you to see the progression. And I think the same is true in our faith. Without a doubt. When we begin having a plan of action for our Bible reading, 
having a journal where we're writing down our prayer request to God. You know, when you go back through that journal and you begin reading and witnessing how God did answer that prayer and God did answer this prayer. Maybe it wasn't the answer you wanted, but he did answer, he did respond. What a fabulous way to then go back and be able to track that just as an Olympic athlete needs to do. To, in order to see their progression and to be able to lay it down and say, here's what I've been doing and what I've been and working on. And you do on. see in that, Jamie, when you're journaling the benefit, you see God's faithfulness over and over, but you say, wow, I've been growing. And again, with the Olympic athletes, it's all about progress forward. It's taking that action to go forward. And that's what God, uh, God's calling us to through Paul in saying, keep moving forward towards that goal at all times. And one of the things that I'm always so impressed by are those, is, is all of us who are, you know, when you set that alarm clock and you say, I'm going to, I'm willing right. to go to bed early. That might mean missing out on something in order to get up and spend that quiet time with God. And I know that Molly was talking about even having to track the sleep. So next up, we're going to take an interview and share with you coach Sean Louster, who coaches athletes. And we're going to see from his angle, how sports and that Olympic attitude follows through into what Paul was saying. We'll be back. training facility in Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, and I'm here with one of my great coaches, Sean Louster. Thanks so much for being with us today. My pleasure, thanks. Um, when we talk about self-discipline, how important would you say is self-discipline in an overall training program? Uh, self-discipline in an overall training, I mean, it's, it's the most important part. You know, it's the thing that's going to get you up in the morning. It's the, it's the thing that to get you motivated and get you moving. You, you have to, you know, you're, you're not going to get results by just sitting around and doing, you know, expecting somebody else to do it for you. You're just going to sit there. So. Right, and what have you personally used in your life to have that sort of self-discipline? Um, one of the things that you know I've done is is one surround myself with people that uh, help make sure I get there. You know, they, they call me up and say, "Hey, where you've been? You know, let's go. It's time to get up. You got to be here at six o'clock in the morning. Let's go." You know, and so uh, I've got a great bunch of people that I work out with here at the gym that uh, are keeping me accountable, making sure that I'm here on time and that I'm doing the weights that I need to be doing. And so uh, I think one of the key factors is just surrounding yourself with the people that you need. Now, as a coach, when you have new newbies, we'll call them, come in, can you sometimes pick out those almost right away who aren't going to be as serious as others? Yeah. And what are some of those kind of red flags? Um, you, you know, some, some of those folks that come in that you can kind of kind of tell is is one they're they're not excited they're not they're not ready to be here they're not looking forward to it you can kind of see the look on their eyes they're like I'm just here mom told me to be here or my my husband <laughs> drug me here my here. wife yeah. said I need to lose a couple pounds you know and so you can kind of see you know um, you know if they it's almost like we say they kind of walk around with a little chip on their shoulder like I don't really need this or I'm better than this like kind of an attitude. Um, you know, but what's amazing is there's some folks that would come through the doors and you would think like, uh, yeah, there's no way they're going to stick with it. Maybe they're a little more meek, a little more mild, a little softer, but they're the ones that end up falling in love with it. As a coach, obviously you understand that role. Mm -hmm. Have you been coached as well? And in general, what do you see as the value of having a coach? Um, I, I have been able to experience the being coached as well. Um, and uh, what's great about it is that one, it's a motivating factor. You know, so there, there's always somebody there to, to be your cheerleader, to, to say, come on, you can go a little harder, a little faster, one more rep, I know you got it in you. And, and when you think, you know, I'm about to tap out, they say, one more rep, okay, I will, because you feel, <laughs> you feel obligated, like, okay, you're asking for it, I gotta give it to you. But then also, what's great about a coach is that they're, they're a bit of a safety net. You know, so when they start to see you, uh, your form start to sacrifice, or uh, they start to see maybe, maybe they can tell you, maybe you don't have one more rep. They can tap you out and say, hey, take a break, take a knee, you know, recover. You know, and so, so what's great about having that coach there is they can kind of help direct you and make sure you're taking the right steps and doing the right things, you know, and make sure you're doing them safely, you know, as opposed to potentially hurting yourself. Perfect. So we so appreciate your time today. Thank yeah. you so much. Pleasure. Thank you so much.
And we're back. Julie, share with us. Sean really talks about the importance of self-discipline as it pertains to his workout routine. He said it was really everything. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing for the Christian, Jamie. Our discipline, in fact, there used to be a much greater emphasis on the godly disciplines, the discipline of being in the Word of God. And I think so much we talk about that and go, what does that really look like? Just like, what does it mean to go to the gym and have a, a workout routine? It means that you have a set place or a set time that you make that and go, that's the priority of my day. I know for me about 18 years ago, the Lord led me to say, you need to have a schedule, a way in which you are setting that every day I've got a way in which I approach my study of the word. So for example, I read through the Bible every single year and that's a part of that routine, part of that habit by not just saying, oh, I need to be in the word, but making certain I'm intentional about what I'm gonna to do to be in the Word. Also to be in other Bible studies as well. Um, the other part is to have a devotional and prayer life. Reading the Word is critical, but the fellowship with God that comes through a prayer life, in fact, it's that whole, you can't really grow in your spiritual walk if you're not listening to God as well as sharing with Him the burdens yeah, of your own what, heart. And what I love, when I'm just listening to what you're saying here, it shows the difference between someone who is that Olympian of the faith, who's really pressing in and going all out, totally focused, has a plan. Their workout routine is gonna involve a lot more than somebody who is not an Olympian, who's not it really training. Going and they're just it. like, show up to the gym and wonder, I wonder what I should do today. Yeah. Versus an Olympian who their schedule, and I know you, so I know when you say, I'm reading through the Bible in a year, you actually already have it planned, what part of the Bible you're reading on which days, and it's mapped out for the whole year. Like an Olympian is gonna look and say, okay, I know those games are coming in four years, in two years. That's right. And everything they do every single day is a, a, a concise plan that has a purpose to it. To exercise the different muscles for the Olympian, but to exercise our faith muscles. We're gonna be right back, and when we come back, we are going to have with us former NFL football players to talk to us about how they took the disciplines necessary to win on the field and brought that into their faith journey with Pete Gonzalez and Stephen Avery. Stay tuned. We want to thank our sponsor, Glory House, for the Today I Choose To tabletop canvas that reminds us all to be intentional with our choices. To see more products like this, visit gloryhouse.com. Welcome, and we've been talking about how to have faith like a champion, and what better people to bring in than what I call champions. So few men actually make it to the professional level in football, and we thought it'd be an awesome opportunity for us to share with you some of the lives and the testimonies of a couple NFL players. Thank you so much for being with us. We've got Pete Gonzalez, who played not only for Pitt, but also for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and Stephen Avery, who you've played for a number of teams. We have the Houston Oilers, Kansas City Chiefs, Green Bay Packers, as well as the Steelers. Thanks you, thank you both for being with us today. And as always, my co-host Julie and our Bible scholar is here. So guys, again, so few men actually make it to that level. Tell us what sort of discipline was required to really be able to win on the field, and how is that carried over to your faith? Well, it's a daily, daily grind, I guess you would kind of say. Um, every day you have to wake up, you know what you have to do, and you have to get it done because you're kind of like a dime a dozen almost. If you don't do it good enough, somebody else is going to be right there. And they're constant, constantly looking for your replacement. So there's that, that sense of urgency that's always there. Every morning I would get up, um, you know, and I'd try to follow. They'd give you some sort of schematic in the off season to follow or what have you. But, you know, you just follow that and you'll get in shape and you'll develop the way they want you. And you just got to kind of have faith in that system. And if you do, um, you'll emerge to be, uh, you know, part of the team. And that, if you don't, well, <clears throat> that's quite an incentive. Knowing right, I could be right. replaced tomorrow. Well, what? No, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what makes it even more challenging. I kind of, I kind of laugh at, at the list of teams there because I played for a few teams and Steve did himself. And you know, the more teams you play for, that means that you are expendable. I mean, you were one of those guys that every day you went to work. That's right, because you, know, you yeah. were also playing for the Colts yeah, and the Bills. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. And, yeah, and you know, I was a backup quarterback for most of my career. So, you know, when you go in the league, you understand that, you know, if you're not drafted high and you don't get on the field right away, you're one of the expendable products. You, you are a guy that every practice you're being evaluated where you're coming back a next practice 
a following year whether they're going to extend the contract. So it takes a lot of self-discipline to know that those are the challenges you're facing. Sure. Can you imagine going to work every day and thinking you're going to be replaced? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, just going to do your clerical job. I mean, and, and yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot of high pressure. So, you know, you live in that bubble. You learn how to survive in that bubble. But you pick up some pretty good, some pretty good, uh, um, you know, techniques on how to do that. And part of it is that self-discipline, knowing that you have to block out the negativity, block out the noise, and focus on what your tasks are. And those objectives are set by your team, by your coaches, you know, your personal objectives. But then there has to be a faith component to it to know that, hey, there's something bigger here that controls this that I could put my trust in. And I think that's where that, that component comes into play. So speaking of faith, what sort of discipline in your life has, has brought the most fruit for you? Uh, you know, I'm gonna start this one off. Well, I, I'll go ahead. <laughs> you know, you know it, being a father, I think that's probably been the one, the one area that's given me a tremendous focus is understanding that, you know, the, the whole creation component of it, the whole being a husband part of it, the whole being a father, that gave me a whole new perspective on life and a new okay. attitude on that. So that's, that's been the biggest piece that has affected me. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's receiving forgiveness from God. Um, I think in a world that we grew up in with performance is everything. Yeah. Every day you are graded on performance. And when somebody told me that I was really forgiven and I was accepted and loved by God, not because of what I performed, but because I believed, and there was a lot of burdens that came off. And the things that you learn in the world in systems of discipline are great. But if you do not receive that forgiveness and love and all that Jesus paid to give us that, a lot of Christians are still going to church. They, they have no idea how good God really is. But that, I think, is the backbone for me to love my kids. It when I receive love from God, it empowers me to be able to love Pete, to love my family, love That's my right. wife, love my yes. kids. And it is a force that we have we don't put enough weight on that force, and which we should, because I, I think love, yes. love and forgiveness is amazing. And when we come back, we're going to hear more top tips from these excellent men of God and superior athletes. God's Word is life-changing, but some people just don't know how to study it, especially when they have a specific issue or need in their life. What if you had this? I want to introduce you to a topic-specific Bible study in a box where you will learn, pray, and conquer life's challenges through this easy-to-use Bible study so you can live victoriously. Through this study, you and your friends and family will receive the life-changing power of God's Word in a simple, effective way. This study contains 52 cards that have a scripture on one side and a prayer relating to that scripture on the reverse side. You can use the study in its entirety or one card at a time in so many different ways. Be inspired during your family devotionals. Your child will be inspired at bedtime. Read a new one each day before work. Or simply send them to friends and family who might need encouragement. The sky's the limit. To order the Bible study in a box, simply visit trueviewministries.org and click on the shop link. Bible study in a box is a great tool for memorizing scriptures and learning to pray effectively. Don't hesitate. Go to trueviewministries.org and click on the shop link at the top of the page to order today your Bible study in a box. Take your faith to a new level and order today. And we're back with our former NFL players, Pete Gonzalez and Stephen Avery, just to hear some of their top tips on how we can grow in our faith. Gentlemen? Steve, I'm gonna let you go first, because you, <laughs> you have a lot to say on this topic. <laughs> well, again, um, I think every day we, we wake up, and as men, we all have pressures, and it's easy to, to focus on that. And there's a lot of things going on in the world, and it's easy to focus on that, too. And, one of the disciplines, uh, I've tried to shut out kind of the vertical or the horizontal mm -hmm. feeds that try to come at you all the time because it's really easy to get tripped up and get concerned about too many different things. But whenever I really just say, you know what, Jesus, I'm just going to look and focus on you. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything crazy spiritual. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. And when you go vertical, there's a faithfulness that God has that somehow he is going to start orchestrating things for you, opening doors, lining things up. But it's a battle. 
It doesn't automatically happen. In the moment you feel condemned or the moment you feel like you're not good enough or whatever, you got to speak life out to yourself. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I don't feel it, but by faith. Well, you know, for me, man, that's a tough act to fall out. Man. No, 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 no. Man, I feel like hugging you, man. Come here. That was good stuff, man. Hey. I want to sing that for King and Country. <laughs> oh, no. You know, it's, um, it's interesting because, um, you know, for me, it's, it's really, you know, we were professional athletes and we worked hard to get to where we're at. And, and I was taught every skill you need to learn. In a, every skill you need to learn to be a great follower of Christ, I learned playing sports. And really it starts with your attitude. It starts with how you wake up in the morning and how you, what, you, what your task is for that day. You know, when I played football, I had a great attitude, right? I woke up in the morning, loved to go, go to practice, loved to be around the guys. Whatever it took, coach, whatever it takes. If I had to be at a function at six and I wasn't done with what I had to do at the, at the office, I wasn't going anywhere. I was studying my film, putting extra, I mean, that was the attitude I carried. And one of the things that became apparent to me is I didn't have that attitude towards Christ early on. I didn't have it. I had to make an attitude shift. And anything we do in life has to do with your attitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times in a relationship with your wife, how many times have I got up in the morning and just been mad at my wife, my attitude has been crappy, and my day goes crappy? It's just a yeah. fact, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, you, have to, you have to consciously make that change in your mind and, and change your attitude towards that. So in applying that same concept towards, you know, my spiritual growth and my faith and my belief and being able to walk that every day, I've had to make some changes in my attitude. You know, oh, I have to go to church again. Well, you know, no, it's not that anymore. Now I'm going to church because there's a message being sent that's mm -hmm. going to feed me. All right, see, that's, that's where the attitude change happens. You know, it's going to feed me. It's going to help me become a better man. It's going to change my heart. It's going to address some issues that I have in my heart. It's going to help me with my wife and my children. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's always been about going with the right attitude. And then, you know, Steve and I, we shared something probably about, about when Joel was here. When was Joel here? When was your brother here? Uh, a couple months ago. A few months ago, we were yeah. talking about some things. And, you know, I, we, we call it gloves up. You know, our, our, our yeah. say is gloves up. You know, always have your gloves up. <laughs> you know, a boxer, a boxer, when he fights to protect himself, he has to put his gloves up. If not, he's going to get his behind knocked out, you know? Well, Christians the same way, right? Every day we step out, outside of the body of Christ, and we go into the world, we have to have our gloves up because we're going to get hit from a lot of different directions. And you have to arm yourself with the tools. And to me, I use gloves up. And, and that's, that's all it'll say. So that, that would be my advice is, you know, an attitude and understand every time you step out, you got to have your gloves up. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Yep. Well, re just remember, keep those gloves up, and we so appreciate you watching us here on TrueView. If you'd like to connect with us, you can visit us on our Facebook page or at trueviewministries.org.